Hey guys, uh, I'm reacting to History Summarized Ireland, so yeah, let's get started. History of Ireland seems like the tale of one island getting beat up for over a thousand years straight, and, well, that's not incorrect, I'll be honest with you. But from another perspective, it's a story of a unique civilization rising from the intersection of two very different worlds, and then remarkably enduring through centuries of subjugation and hardship. When it's all too common to see entire cultures wiped from existence because of colonial oppression, Ireland is a very hard-fought counterexample. To see what makes Ireland's history so special, and to learn how Irish culture survived to the present day, let's do some history. This video is brought to you by Audible. More on that later. Our story begins with the migration of the Celts from Central Europe sometime in the 5th to 3rd-ish centuries BC. Okay, look, it's an ancient migration, alright? Dates are gonna be finicky on this one. And they settled <laughs> on this little island here, which they named Eire after the goddess Eiru, which I maybe said right? I don't know, I'm just gonna try and say as few Irish names- Irish pronunciation do be hard as possible so I don't embarrass myself, which is where we get the name Ireland. And speaking of language, they spoke an early version of Irish, which is a subset of the Gaelic language family, which is a subset of the Celtic language family. Not confusing at all. Though Ireland's didn't have a written literary tradition, the culture venerated storytelling bards, as well as druids, who are priest-like figures that doubled as historians, judges, and even doctors. Another popular profession in Ireland was, surprisingly enough, king, because there was no overarching central authority, so Ireland usually had somewhere around 150 local Tuatha that each had their own king. And there were no cities at this point either, so people just Damn. clustered into groups on available farmland and got to it. Though Ireland wasn't politically unified, they shared many elements of art and religion, from Celtic knots to Ku Cullen. Irish mythology is rad, and you can see some examples here. Irish mythology is rad. I've seen a little bit of it. I mean, I definitely want to I'll learn more and like uh, react to some videos, so maybe in the future. But yeah, damn, Irish mythology, epic. I love Celtic mythology in general. Here, but there are also all manner of gods, heroes, and some pretty bonkers magic too. Sadly, we don't have- Magic? Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> have as much information on them as we might like because the Irish mythological cycle wasn't codified until centuries later, and parts Damn. of it have since been lost. Plus, the stories themselves sometimes conflict- I've heard of the Ulster cycle. ...conflict with one another on account of how regional these oral traditions were. Though we today only know so much about early Celtic Ireland, the picture gets clearer and the culture gets richer with Ireland's second big arrival, Christianity. Ireland actually got the good end of the deal on this one, because their conversion was peaceful and it didn't involve them getting invaded by Rome. When Oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> Win, and quite the opposite, in fact, as Irish pirates often found their way to the western coast of Roman Britain. In one instance, <laughs> a captured young Roman lived in Ireland for six years before escaping back to Britain, and after some soul-searching, he trained in France to become a priest and set back out to Ireland in the hopes of converting the people to Christianity. Though he wasn't the first missionary to Ireland, this Saint Patrick, as you've probably guessed, was certainly the most consequential. The dates for his life and career are all over the place, and there's even a theory that Saint... The two Patricks theory, St. Patrick was actually a combination of Patrick and another figure named Pala Palladius. Patrick is actually an amalgamation of two different characters, but this show is history summarized and I am super not qualified to settle very much ongoing debates in the academic historical community. But what we can say for certain is that he never drove the snakes out of Ireland, because Ireland never had snakes. That's just I've a very blunt myth. code word for <laughs> pagans. And even that oh. isn't fully accurate. Patrick. Buddy, you're killing me here. Because Celtic culture didn't just go away. It's a classic example of syncretism, where the goal is to make two disparate cultures. Inclusive approach of combining unique religious practices and beliefs together. So even just regular Christianity and Catholicism is already a lot of uh, syncretism going on. <laughs> like Christmas. You know, the Christmas tree comes from a pagan tradition. I think it's like Saturnalia. But yeah, like, you know. Christmas is like on the same day as Saturnalia, so <laughs> interesting. And Saturn, Saturnalia was just like the Roman holiday celebrating um, Saturn or Kronos, Greek god of time and like harvest, I think. So, yeah, interesting. All goes back to something. It all kind of sync. It all kind of uh, syncs up and just combines a bit. Cultures coexist rather than have one completely supplant the other. Latin was introduced, but it was spoken right alongside Irish Gaelic. Monasteries were built all around the islands, but they were regionally autonomous. Jesus was the new number one, but the old Irish mythology remained firmly in the popular conscience. 
best of both worlds. And the timing of all this couldn't have been better, because while mainland Europe was splintering out into dozens of Gothic kingdoms in the wake of the Western Roman Empire's collapse, Ireland just got a jolt of new culture to play with and about 400 years of complete peace to refine it. The strongest Damn. literary nice. <laughs> tradition in Europe was made in Irish monasteries, often called scriptoria, where accounts of old Irish mythology were written alongside beautiful among the most famous of these is the Book of Kells, an illuminated manuscript of the four Gospels of the New Testament. Yeah, illuminated manuscripts are, are really, really beautiful. Like, let's just take a look. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's just um, illuminated manuscripts, just like handwritten books. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Let's, let's also check the definition. <laughs> Um, an illuminated manuscript is a manuscript in which the text is supplemented with such decoration as initials, borders, and miniature il illustrations. In the strictest definition, the term refers only to manuscripts decorated with either gold or silver. But in both common usage and modern scholarship, the term refers to any decorated or illustrated, or illustrated manuscript from Western traditions. Cool, cool. Yeah, some of these be looking mad nice. Ooh, cool stuff, huh? Anyway, okay, let's get back to the video. Beautifully decorated manuscripts of the Bible. All around, Ireland was known as the Isle of Saints and Scholars, and it's because of their hard work that so much ancient Latin work survives today. I That's epic. Yeah. Props to Ireland. Irish missionaries to Europe even laid the groundwork for Charlotte. Quick rule of thumb for ancient literature. If it's in Greek, then we got it via the Byzantines. Well, I mean the Eastern Romans. I mean, Byzantines not really the best name for the for the Eastern Romans, but whatever. If it's in Latin, then we got it from Ireland. Damn, interesting. Charlemagne's 9th century renaissance in France. It's also during this golden age that we see and hear two core symbols of Irish culture, the Celtic cross and the harp. The cross appears in stone all over Ireland, and it's a perfect visual metaphor for how Celtic Irish culture is literally woven into Irish Christianity. Again, all this while the rest of Europe was having some serious, eh, let's call it growing pains. Although Ireland... Yeah. Ireland was decentralized in both government and religion, it enjoyed over four centuries of peace between the numerous Tuatha and no threat of invasion. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, and all shiny things must get raided by Vikings. And speaking of Vikings, Vikings! Though Ireland's didn't quite get hit as bad as the English and Scots one island over, Ireland saw its fair share of coastal looting and burning. Monasteries were an easy target because of their abundance of treasures like gemstone covered manuscripts and their non-abundance of defensive fortifications. The Vikings did, however, contribute Ireland's first cities of Dublin, Cork, Waterford, and others settled along the island's coasts. And as the Vikings got comfortable in their cities and chilled out enough to stop with the damn raiding all the time, their cities became hubs for trade and production. Ultimately though, Ireland's much bigger problem for the next thousand years would come from right across the channel. And oh golly gosh, would you look at the damn. clock, it's time to complain about England, whoo! <clears throat> Sorry, professionalism. I mean, England did a lot, lot, lot of things wrong. In India, Ireland, all over. So while Ireland was having a good time minding its own business and not bothering anyone else, the Anglo-Normans came over to establish the Lordship of Ireland, which sounds a lot more, uh, complete than it actually was. England <laughs> held on to the urban population centers in the east, but because of stuff like wars and plague, it was pretty patchy for the next five centuries. But in 1509, Henry VIII became king and decided that he wanted to be a really big deal, so it's here that things start getting rough. See, Henry converted to Protestantism after he got tired of killing his wives and wanted to just divorce them instead, but Ireland remained firmly Catholic. This displeased Henry, so he made a new push to colonize Ireland, and England made steady progress in beating up on the Irish. Irish, taking more yeah this bastard is annoying Henry yeah I mean it's an interesting history but he was awful especially later in life yeah awful more and more of their land and busting down their monasteries and churches. Unsurprisingly, the Irish rebelled. Several times. In the decade after the union of the English and Scottish crowns in 1603, King James confiscated Irish land in the northern region of Ulster to make way for Scottish colonists to start private plantations. And this marks and isn't that um like kind of ironic just because Irish people kind of settled Scotland in the beginning too, because um, Scotland comes from like I think the Scotty tribe or clan, uh, which were which was an Irish uh, group. So, but I'm not 100 percent sure of this. Let's see. 
What is Scotland named after? All right, let's see. Yeah, you may already know that um, Scotland got its name from the Scotty or Scotty, a Gaelic speaking people who had come from Ireland around 580 and settled in Argyll. Named then Dalriata or Dalriada. But where did the Scotty get the name from? According to the Scot. Scotticronian, Scoticron, Scrot, <laughs> shit, this hard to pronounce. Uh, Scoticronicon, one of the earliest histories of Scotland, written in the 1440s. There was a legend that the Greek prince called Gaithelos was banished with his wife Scota. Uh, the daughter of an Egyptian fairy, he sailed westwards and landed in Spain. From there, he and his followers explored further, and one of his sons, named Hyber, found an island, later called Ireland, which he named Gotia after his mother. So G Gaithelos' name gave rise to Gaelic. Hyber gave rise to Hibernia, slash, you know, uh, also known as Ireland. And Scota gave rise to Scotia and then Scotland. It This book does not explain, however, why Ireland is no longer called Scotia and why the Scotia came to Ar Argo. Um, anyway, it's an interesting theory, uh, our history. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that though, <laughs> but yeah, uh, the Scoti tribe were a Gaelic speaking people from Ireland, um, around 500 AD and they settled in Scotland and that's why Scotland is named Scotland. So, and now it's, it's quite the irony that Scottish people, Sc Scottish Prot Protestants are settling this region of Ireland. Also, a lot of these Scottish Irish people uh, settled in the U.S. as well. I think in the U.S. they're called like Scot Scotch Irish or Scot, yeah, Scotch Irish kind of. Yeah, <laughs> interesting name. It's the start of a couple unfortunate defining trends for the next. Sorry for that long tangent, by the way. <laughs> next three centuries. First is the treatment of Ireland as a subservient colony, and the steady seizure of Irish land, and also the persecution of Catholicism through strict social laws. In the 17th and 19th centuries, Irish farmers became tenants in their own. Yeah, and that's uh, Northern Ireland. <laughs> yeah, they really, really changed up that part of Ireland. Own island, and this process only accelerated with the advent of anti-royalist and civil war extraordinaire Oliver Cromwell, who murdered his way across Ireland during his War of the Three Kingdoms. More land was confiscated, Catholic Irish were forcibly evicted, and also banned from certain jobs. And for the next three hundred years, Ireland was regarded as little more than a conquered colony. Although the anti-Catholic laws were largely repealed by the turn of the nineteenth century, Ireland was still poorer going into the eighteen hundreds than it had arguably ever been, as its production and wealth were systematically siphoned off to Britain. Only the the majority British Fuck. pockets of the island in Dublin and Ulster saw much improvement, and it was these Ulster Irish who saw British so pockets of the say? island in Dublin and Ulster saw Belfast was and is the largest city in the Ulster region of Ireland. Much improvement, and it was these Ulster Irish who spoke for Ireland in the new United Kingdom's parliament. If this all sounds short sighted, exploitative, and extremely fragile, you'd be correct. But wait, it only gets worse. See, Ireland's agriculture was. Well, dangerously precarious. Most of their food production was beef exports to Britain, and that didn't leave a whole lot of available farmland on Ireland. Beef was such a delicacy in part because large cattle require lots of land and resources to cultivate. So it was up to the Irish to raise and feed all of these cows to meet British demand. Oh man, yep, yeah, of course. Damn English. <laughs> Ireland for feeding the Irish. So the tenant farmers turns to potatoes, which had by far the most nutritional value for the Oh yeah, potatoes, amazing. It's an amazing crop from South America, you know, like Peru, Bolivia, and Chile, that region, you know, cultivated by the Incan. So, yeah, damn. And then, you know, it was brought to Europe by Spain. For the space they took to grow. Not super great that the system... Uh, let's see. Dramatic exploitation of their land... Huh. Does the sound still work? Not sure if the sound is actually working right now. Sorry about that. 
forced Catholic Irish to okay, subsist yeah. entirely on a single food staple for generations, but at least they're not starving. So anyway, in 1846, the potato blight hit Ireland and all of the crops failed, so people started starving. Yep. Cool. <sighs> the thing is, potato crops were going rotten all across America and Europe. Ireland was just the only place where potatoes were the only option. But with the crisis at hand, Parliament acted swiftly to provide rations and relief to... <laughs> no, no, they did I'm not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Parliamentarians yeah. in London insisted that the reports of famine were completely overblown and refused to divert resources for aid. Help did slowly arrive, but it was predicated on putting Ireland through economic reforms to modernize their infrastructure. Yeah, because that's exactly exactly what Ireland was asking for. Not food. God, no. Laissez-faire mercantilism. Way to read the room, guys. Eventually, the blight passed and things slowly returned to normal. Devastation of the famine. Severity of food shortages and reliance on government rations. South and West hit especially hard. Northeast was relatively spared. Of course it was, yeah. But not before one in seven people died of starvation and one in four fled to places like America. This would be why yeah. New York and Boston have big Irish communities that materialize out of nowhere in the late 1840s. The more you know. And real- True, yeah, true. Real quick before we move on to the 1900s, it's not a coincidence that the areas least affected by the famine were the Protestant parts. And if that wasn't bad enough, Britain was also busy shutting down the last remaining hedge schools that taught Greek and Latin to Catholic kids. Before this, Ireland's Catholicism had produced the long- All right, pack it up, lads. The only language you need to be you need you be needing is the Queen's English. Thank you very much. Ah, <sighs> damn. Biggest continuous tradition of Greek and Latin anywhere on Earth, but God forbid kids who aren't Anglican be allowed to learn. Gross. So, what to do from here? Well, if you're the population of Ireland in the early 1900s, the answer was literally anything else, and that echoed in a call for home rule and their own independent government. However, Ulster was still fiercely unionist, and it almost looked like pro-union and pro-home rule paramilitary groups were going to start fighting a battle when World War I suddenly became a much more pressing issue. But on Easter of 1916, Irish insurgents occupied government buildings in Dublin, so the British Army shelled them into surrender and then executed the rebel leader. This, you may guess, did not sit super great with the Irish public, so as soon as the World War was over, Ireland fought a guerrilla war of independence, and in 1922 it was granted home rule as their own free state under the British crown. And in the late 30s and 40s, Ireland transitioned into a fully independent republic. Ulster, however, opted to stay in the UK and became known as Northern Ireland. The split between North and South came to a head in the latter part of the century, as Northern Irish Catholics still faced heavy discrimination, and their peaceful protests met violent opposition. Damn. Damn. And this erupted into the Troubles, three decades of insurgency, terrorism, and police brutality in Northern Ireland, as IRA irregulars fought against Ulster volunteer forces and British police to end British rule in Northern Ireland. After some 3,500 casualties, most of them civilian, the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 mandated that Northern Ireland could vote to unify with the Republic at any time they liked, and that there would never again be a hard border on the island between North and South. Oh, God, dear God, Ooh. not again. <laughs> Whew, <laughs> Even when Irish history lets up, it doesn't let up. Meanwhile, the Republic of Ireland enacted a series of economic and political reforms to lift the country out of hundreds of years of poverty. And today, the people of Ireland are safer. Yeah, a lot of U.S. investment, you know, because it's like kind of a tax haven. <laughs> richer, better fed, and freer to express their religion than they've been in centuries. It's distressing to see Ireland so cruelly oppressed for so long, but it's inspiring to see- What's the Irish GDP? Um... Ireland GDP. Let's see. Um, how developed economy developed focusing on services and high tech, life sciences, financial services, and agriculture, including agri food. Okay. Uh, Ireland is an open economy and ranks first for high value foreign direct investment flows. Interesting. But let's see. The. Ch -ch 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 GDP. Um. Huh. I think, oh, the island GDP, 347 billion. So, yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> Do be a lot, huh? 
Okay. Uh, interesting. Sorry for the the uh, the wait. Let's go back to the video. To see the past century's reclamation of Irish culture and their long-deserved independence in Ireland, history is never far away. The legacy. Hopefully, they can start speaking the language more again. Of their centuries long golden ages, everywhere from the Celtic cross to the Irish language. And the painful memory of the Great Famine has motivated Ireland to become a world's leader in international food aid. And I will gladly raise a pint to that. <laughs> In ancient Ireland, monks had to copy entire manuscripts by hand, but now it's never been easier to get instant access to a world of literature thanks to today's sponsor, Audible. Yeah, that was really enjoyable. Um, you know, Ireland is so fascinating. I uh, very much enjoyed this video, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.